Go for main engine start. We have main engine start. Two, one. Booster ignition and the final liftoff of Discovery. The shuttle has cleared the tower. The production of this film has been made possible by a generous funding from Badur Charitable Foundation. They have been at ride into orbit. Discovery now making one last reach for the stars. Reducing the stress on the shuttle as it goes supersonic. Discovery Houston, you are go at throttle up. Discovery's engines are now throttling down as the orbiter passes through the area of maximum pressure. Will Commander Steve Lindsay acknowledging the call from Capcom and Charlie Hobe as Discovery's three main engines throttle back up. T minus 16 seconds. Sound suppression water system has been activated. Pad from protecting Two Discovery and the launch. Start. We have a go for main engine start. T minus five, four, three, two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery, hoisting harmony to the heavens and opening new gateways for international science. Discovery has cleared the tower. Liftoff, liftoff indeed. To some people, this is truly the moment of illumination in the story of modern science. A full rounded, four dimensional moment that triggered into an almost totally new dimension, man's age old quest for answers to a few existential questions. Where did we come from? How did this happen? And what is our destiny? Questions among many that persistently preoccupied our human race since time immemorial. Ancient myths created by that quest were the outcome of many a civilization. Philosophers and early scientists, driven by human curiosity centuries ago, have had their fair share of search and research. When darkness reigned, even before the advent of the Middle Ages, those mind expeditions were destined to gain new ground. For a few centuries, a remarkable contribution was made to the birth of modern age. But when the torch was about to die out, a few courageous men had ultimately managed, against all odds, to pick up the torch and eventually the pursuit for scientific answers acquired a new momentum. And over the last hundred years, man's quantum leap into almost all realms of knowledge has caused a close encounter to happen for the first time on another world. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. One small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. Since that defining moment, mankind is still pushing the cosmic envelope into brave new dimensions of science, discovery, and imagination. A free leap into space in an artist impression seems almost the only gateway to the heavens, a driving force behind man's burning desire to fly out and away to see and know his place in the universe. He is there now, overtaken by awe and wonder, trying to ascend through what seemed for long forbidding frontiers around those cosmic gates, the gates of heaven. If we were to open for them a gate into heaven, and they proceeded to ascend through it, they would say, Our eyes have been bedazzled. Rather, we are a bewitched people. 1515 
The biggest of the biggest secrets of nature is this most fundamental question. How did the universe come into being? By the late 1940s, there were two models describing the existence of the universe. One of the Ukrainian theoretical physicist George Gamow's Big Bang model claiming that the universe started by splitting an unbelievably tiny and dense mass about 14 billion years ago. Then, it had been cooling and inflating ever since. The other opposing model was that of the steady state proposed by British astronomer and mathematician Fred Hoyle. His model is also known as the infinite universe theory. No beginning and no ending. In Hoyle's universe there was no point of creation and all matter had not been produced in a single moment in the past. In fact, he believed that new matter was forming all the time. Hoyle passionately believed that his theory would eventually be borne out by observation, whereas the Big Bang would not, and to his mind, could not. Intending to belittle Gamov's theory, Hoyle jocularly called it the Big Bang. The name stuck. Jim Al-Khalili, professor of theoretical physics at the University of Surrey, England, opened a 2010 lecture on the creation of the universe with these memorable lines. In less than 100 years, science has performed a miracle. It had truly explained where we come from and was able to describe the entire 14 billion year history of the cosmos. In the beginning was the Big Bang. Bang. Al-Khalili continues, that was an explosion of unimaginable power. In the following 10 minutes in the searing heat, the nuclei of just two types of atom emerged, hydrogen and helium. For the next 300,000 years, the universe expanded at that point, another cosmic chapter began. Individual atoms separated out from each other, and as they did this, they released light. It's the remnants of this light that radio astronomers Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson picked up with their horn antenna in 1965. Then, millions of years after this, massive clouds of hydrogen coalesced into the first stars. In here, they began to fuse, producing starlight and eventually all the other types of atoms and tiny particles that exist in the universe today. More proof of Penzias and Wilson experiment on cosmic background radiation for which they were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1978, comes with COBE, the Cosmic Background Explorer, the satellite launched in 1989. Here is a map of the universe as it was 300,000 years after the primeval explosion. These spots are growing to be gigantic structures, 300 million light years across in our present age. So we have seen them before they were blown up and before they expanded with the universe. Professor Al-Khalili follows up in another brilliant entry in August 2011 entitled The Big Bang Lost Horizons, saying it was the long-awaited result. At last the variations in the background radiations had been found. A quarter of a century since Benzias and Wilson had heard the first echo of the Big Bang.
But despite the COBE conclusive evidence, Fred Hoyle didn't abandon his steady state model of the universe. Even once Hoyle loyalist, notable British physicist Dennis Siyama, who defended the steady state model for a long time, had to abandon it in the wake of the discovery of the cosmic microwave radiation in 1965. Siyama reportedly admitted that the game is over. But not to a stubborn atheist Hoyle. Jim continues, Hoyle kept the harsh opposition of the theory that he had inadvertently named. He went to his grave in 2001 still believing that his theory was correct and that the Big Bang was wrong. But the evidence was now stacked up against him. The fact that Hubble had observed in 1929 galaxies hurtling away from each other, meaning that our universe was expanding, that Penzias and Wilson had detected in 1965 the radiation left over from the primordial fireball, and that COBE had detected in 1989 ripples within this cosmic radiation. We live in a Big Bang universe, and uh, that we're seeing the radiation from 300,000 years after the Big Bang. In many cases, when there's a paradigm shift in science, it takes a generation before people really accept it. But in this case, I think the world was ready for it. Human societies have always worried about where they came from. There are religious stories in every civilization that's ever been found. And I think we have a def definitive answer, that we came out of a Big Bang. And there is one more addition to these conclusive Big Bang proofs. The October 4th, 2011 physics breakthrough of the Nobel Prize winning discovery of the acceleration of the expanding universe. Al-Khalili concludes, all this has provided overwhelming evidence for a universe created by a Big Bang. In its exclusive fashion of one word enough to open wide more than one gate of research for the serious reflector, the Quran elegantly gives it all in abundance. In just two words, revealed some 1400 years ago, two extremely quintessential states of nature are described. Rotka. One mass is the first word of the beginning. Fatka, split, is the second word of the happening. Let's read verse 30, chapter 21. Have those who disbelieve, not seen by the knowledge they acquire, that the heavens and the earth were conjoined in one mass. Then we caused them to split. Officer Richard Barley is currently Chief Inspector at the Counterterrorism Command in Metropolitan Police, New Scotland Yard in London. Besides his job, he enjoys other passions. I took A-level physics and, and I've maintained my interest in physics even though I've become a police officer. And, and I've used physics in my work um, on, um, on different investigations. And so, yes, my interest in passion in physics continues. My oldest son is, uh, um, uh, has just received a Master of Physics from Oxford University and is doing a doctorate in physics. We talk physics at home. Varley's first contact with the Quran wasn't exactly planned. I'd never looked at it until the time of the, um, the issues around the, sat the satanic verses. My wife was bought the, the novel for Christmas. I didn't take any interest with it until the, 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 the issue blew up over what um, Samam Rushdie had said and the threats against him and the burning of books. Out of interest, I s sought a Quran and I bought a copy of the, 
um, Yusuf Ali translation of the Quran in Hampstead from a bookshop and read it because I felt it was something I as a police officer needed to know more about because it was such a controversy and it was affecting relationships between Muslims and, and the community. The Great Split Big Bang verse was one of the three verses in the Quran that turned Richard Varley's life, in his own words, downside up. Well, I mean, to me, when I read it, I, 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 I immediately thought of the, of the Big Bang theory and, um, and, and the, the formation of the universe. And I thought how strange it was to see something like that in, in a book which I'd, I'd bought with an open mind. To the three physicists who garnered, on October 4, 2011, the Nobel Prize in Physics for the 2011 chapter, the fruit of so many years of cosmic observation has finally paid off. Cosmologists Saul Permuter, Adam Rees, and Brian Schmidt have been working in teams of astronomers observing the redshift and the brightness of 58 supernovae. They have found that the remnants of nearly all type 1A supernovae are at least 15% further away than what the standard model of the universe predicts. This implies that the universe is open and will expand forever. It also suggests that a bizarre quantum force is affecting the expansion rate. This information was published in 1998. An outstanding discovery that harks back some 70 years earlier one man's feet, some would call the most singular achievement of modern physics. A man called Edwin Hubble had looked into one night sky in 1929 with his telescope and noticed an extraordinary thing. A remarkable observation that would precipitate the revolutionary idea that Professor Hoyle would eventually sneeringly label the Big Bang. What Hubble saw from his mountain top in California was that the steady, old, dependable universe was in fact anything but steady. Galaxies, he noted, were hurtling away from each other at alarming speeds. In Surah 51, verse 47, Quran clearly talks about God expanding the universe with his power. And that, and that to me, was very clearly a reference to, to what we know now about the way the universe is expanding almost at the speed of light in all directions and um, something that was only discovered in the, in the last hundred years. Now behold the heaven, it is we alone who built it with mighty hands and indeed it is we alone who are expanding it, 4751. So this kind of building of the universe with an organized structure um, seemed to sing through to me from that verse that there was once again this is the Quran speaking to us and God is saying this is divine revelation. The story of finding out that the universe is expanding has unintentionally started with the cosmological constant idea. In an article published in the New York Times in January 2011 entitled Darkness at the Edge of the Universe Physicist Brian Greene comments on the recent discoveries of the accelerated cosmic expansion and explains a bit more. He says, Across large distances, the force that shapes the cosmos is the attractive pull of gravity. And so Einstein reasoned a counterbalancing force would need to provide a repulsive push. But what force could that be? Remarkably, he found that idea that would have, well, blown Newton's mind, anti-gravity, a gravitational force that pushes instead of pulls.
Ordinary matter like the Earth or Sun can generate only attractive gravity. But the math revealed that a more exotic source, an energy that uniformly fills space only invisibly, would generate gravity's repulsive version. Einstein called this space-filling energy the cosmological constant. A dozen years later, however, Einstein rued the day he introduced the cosmological constant. In 1929, the American astronomer Edwin Hubble discovered that distant galaxies are all rushing away from us. Hubble's observations thus established that there was no need for a cosmological constant. The universe is not static. Green reflects on a candid moment of regret. Had Einstein only trusted the original mathematics of general relativity, he would have made one of the most spectacular predictions of all time. That the universe is expanding more than a decade before it was discovered. According to one of his trusted colleagues, he called this mistake the greatest blunder of my life. Hubble has greatly contributed to astronomers' knowledge of dark energy and how this mysterious little understood phenomenon is speeding up the very same expansion of the universe discovered by Edwin Hubble decades before. What everybody believed was that the universal expansion was slowing down due to gravity. I mean, it made sense. Um, there are no repulsive, there's no anti-gravity that we know of, but there is now. An expanding universe means that tomorrow, it'll be bigger than what it is today. It also means, of course, that yesterday, it would have been smaller, the day before, smaller still. And if you keep winding the clock back in time, it eventually arrives at a moment in history when all the stuff of the universe is clumped together in a single tiny region. So, it appeared that the Big Bang believers are winning after all over the steady state clan. On his webpage at the University of California in Berkeley's website, physicist Pearl Muter tells us one interesting notion. Our supernovae observations were originally performed to measure the ratio of a receding cosmic expansion affected by the gravitational attractive pool. Instead, we have only shown its accelerating expansion. You check each step of the, of the process, and little by little, um, you get to the point where you start realizing, you know, this effect isn't going away. This is the right answer. It really looks like the universe is actually speeding up. Richard Varley seems to be impressed by the scientific significance of many verses in the Quran, including the expansion of the universe as indicated in verse 47, chapter 51. Now behold the heaven. It is we alone who built it with mighty hands, and indeed, it is we alone who are expanding it, 4751. The same voice is saying, look what I have done. I have done this. This is a proof that these words are true. So yeah, so that's the way I've, that's the, that's the way I've approached it. And I, sometimes the science is wrong, and it really is, um, because we're in an age now when the science is, is subject to very, very rigorous proof. When the verses concur with, the, the, the science concurs with the Quran, we need to be able to say, as Muslims, be confident and celebrate that and say, look, our book says this, and you just discovered the same. One last note. In his bestseller, 1988 science book, A Brief History of Time, physicist Stephen Hawking draws one beautiful line. The discovery that the universe is expanding was one of the great intellectual revolutions of the 20th century. And indeed, it was.
With an ever-expanding universe, one question keeps ringing. How does the universe hold its pieces together in such expansive formation? Physicist Brian Greene from Columbia University tells us the beginning of the story. As the story goes, one day in 1665, a young man was sitting under a tree when, all of a sudden, he saw an apple fall from above. And with that fall of that apple, Isaac Newton revolutionized our picture of the universe. In an audacious proposal for his time, Newton proclaimed that the force pulling apples to the ground and the force keeping the moon in orbit around the Earth were actually one and the same. In one fell swoop, Newton unified the heavens and the Earth in a single theory he called gravity. Newton claimed that in writing the Principia, I had an eye upon such principles as might work with considering men for the belief of a deity. He saw evidence of design in the system of the world. He wrote, such a wonderful uniformity in the planetary system must be allowed the effect of choice. Hence, no coincidence. Newton's dictum seemingly recalls a part from verse 22, chapter 65 of the Quran. It is he who upholds the heaven in place, so it does not fall to the earth, except by his permission. Newton believed that God alone upholds the sun and the planets in harmony by the sheer force of gravity that God created and he discovered thus saving the solar system from falling upon itself. Although the laws of motion and universal gravitation became Newton's best known discoveries, he warned against using them to view the universe as a mere machine, as if akin to a great clock. He said, gravity explains the motions of the planets, but it cannot explain who set the planets in motion. God governs all things and knows all that is or can be done. Newton's laws of gravity was a landmark step towards understanding how matter is held together in space. But while Newton's laws described the strength of gravity with great accuracy, he had no idea how gravity actually works. 250 years later, the answer to this problem finally arrived. Physicist Peter Gallison from Harvard University flashes back a bit to explain how Einstein came to think of the three dimensions of space and the single dimension of time as bound together in a single fabric of space-time. It was his hope that by understanding the geometry of this four-dimensional fabric of space-time that he could simply talk about things moving along surfaces in this space-time fabric. Physicist Brian Greene adds, like the surface of a trampoline, this unified fabric is warped and stretched by heavy objects like planets and stars. And it's this warping or curving of space-time that creates what we feel as gravity. It may be interesting to note that describing the cosmic web that holds the four dimensions of space-time together in a fabric structure resonates in more than one verse in the Quran. Even the scientist vocabulary is quite amazingly identical to the Quranic. How? We'll soon find out. Let us first check the significance of the word fabric. Fabric, by definition in the Microsoft's Encarta Encyclopedia, is any type of cloth made from woven, knitted, 
or felted threads or fibers. What are the fibers? A fiber is a thin thread, which is a long, slender thread or filament. In Webster's New World Dictionary, a fabric is anything constructed or made of parts put together, structure, building. Moreover, it is, according to Webster, the framework or basic structure of anything. Chambers' English Dictionary describes fabric as texture, anything framed, also manufactured cloth, any system of connected parts. In verse 7, chapter 51 of the Quran, we find a thorough description defining the cosmic structure as fabric. It appears in an oath taken by God. It reads, By the heaven, streaked with fabric, interwoven threads. One cannot resist recalling the Quranic word al-Habuk at this point. The word stands out as a perfect description of all that. As is always the case with the Quranic Arabic vocabulary and semantics, it only takes most of the time to examine just one word to experience a richness over a variety of scales in meaning and shadows of meaning, hence the translation difficulty. Two Arabic words with a preposition in between are translated in English in eight, writer Leslie Hazelton, who is currently working on a new biography of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, due in 2012, shares this view of the exclusive semantics of the Quran. And I began to grasp why it said that the Quran is really the Quran only in Arabic. Take the Fatiha, the seven verse opening chapter that is the Lord's Prayer. It's just 29 words in Arabic, but anywhere from 65 to 72 in translation. And yet the more you add, the more seems to go missing. Al-Hubuk, the Arabic word in the verse describing the cosmic fabric, would come to mean a collection of a variety of textures that are firmly bound together in a certain pattern. It also intonates that the interwoven threads are being produced by a systematic method. The textures are shaped across paths or lines tightly pulled together over knots arranged on the surface. The word also implies that the interwoven threads are skillfully knitted by a master maker. Finally, the word may synonymize with routes extended across a space. Galaxies were once regarded as island universes, isolated realms of gas, dust, and billions of stars that were separated by distances unimaginably vast. But no galaxy is an island. In fact, galaxies prefer company. The gravitational pull of a large, massive galaxy attracts light-sized and smaller neighbors. Galaxies may gather in modest groupings like these or congregate by the hundreds in enormous clusters. This is Abel 1689, one of the largest galaxy clusters known. It packs more than 500 galaxies. This view spans some two million light years, or about the distance between our Milky Way galaxy and the nearest big spiral. As astronomers mapped nearby galaxy clusters, a clearer picture of cosmic structure emerged. Galaxy clusters gathered in superclusters, overlapping other superclusters to form chains and filaments spanning huge swaths of the sky. Welcome 
to the cosmic whip. This all-sky map shows structures created by more than a million nearby galaxies. Deeper studies showed that this pattern continues to even greater distances. The cosmic web appears to be the backbone of our universe. Knots, chains, filaments, cosmic web, networks, all these words are semantically associated with the Quranic word al hobok The Quran tasks us as individuals to look further into science, to look further into understanding the universe. Well, I really prefer, if somebody wants to know about Islam or be introduced to Islam, I prefer that they first read about Islam before they go to read the Quran. Because the Quran is much different from the Bible and its organization and its approach and it's, you know, so you've got that initial sort of obstacle, you know, that where it's much better if they have a context for it. Yusuf Ali was the Quran I read to start with. It, it, his, um, his writing, his translation is the one I've grown into Islam with. What the Quran needs is more people in the West to see the content of the Quran and see the scientific verses so that that skepticism of divine revelation can be looked at afresh and people can understand that there is a holy book that talks to people and talks to modern science and says this is the way the universe is. The Quran is so much more than the other holy books before it. In general, if you think about the Quran, there are all kinds of signs in it and all kinds of indications of the importance of knowledge and the importance of investigation and the importance of seeking to know more about God's creations. You cannot take what is in the Quran as a fait accompli, as a, something that has been completed and this is it and this is all the science there is and you don't need to study anything else if you read the Quran. That can be dangerous and it's wrong. As a scientist, when you're dealing with scientific method, you deal with absolute proofs. So you say, you know, this does this, and I can prove it, and I can show it. So you're not likely to refer to the Quran because it's not within your scientific culture. And I think that's right. What I'm doing is approaching the Quran in a way, I've approached it in a scientific way, saying it purports to be the word of God, and these things in it are revealed to be right. T minus 15 seconds. The sound suppression water system has been activated. And TLS is go for main engine start. We have a go for main engine start. Main engine start. Two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery. Celebrating its 25th birthday by racking up science and supplies to the space station. Houston now controlling the midnight ride of Rick Sterko and his crew to the International Space Station. I'm a believer, and uh, no, I did not see God up there, but you certainly uh, did feel his presence. And so uh, I certainly felt closer to God. You're up there, uh, you know, there's only seven of you up there going around this beautiful world of ours every 90 minutes going once around. And you look at it, and then you look at the stars, you look at our sun, and you say, this is just too perfect for it to be coincidence or a freak of nature, of science, for this to have occurred. There had to be a, a higher being that created all this beauty. And so that's what makes you feel closer to God. Moreover, say, all praise is for God. He shall show all of you his wondrous signs, so that you shall know them to be utterly true. For never is your Lord at all heedless of what you human beings do. 93, 27. <laughs>
Just consider this. Isaac Newton, who was perhaps the greatest scientist of all time, once said about his landmark discoveries, I have been like a boy playing on the seashore, diverting myself and now and then finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than usual, while the great ocean of truth lay before me, all undiscovered. Our understanding of the universe has come an enormously long way during the last three centuries. With science today at the center of the human experience, more opportunities and means are becoming available to help us travel the yet undiscovered realms of knowledge. Whether these realms are to be visited inside ourselves, in the undiscovered 97% of the Earth's oceans, or in the wide open universe around us, the human endeavor is ultimately bound for heavenly contact with the one God of this diversified and unified creation. One thing is certain, Newton's great ocean of truth lies before us. All horizons are accessible, and that is a heavenly promise. Verse 53, chapter 41 of the Quran attests to that. We shall show them our signs in the horizons and in themselves, until it becomes utterly clear to them that this Quran is, indeed, the divine truth. Is it not sufficient that your Lord himself is the witness over all things? 53.41 as alaikum alaykum everyone. Um, I just want to give you a little introduction of why I became Muslim and, and how it just came about really. To start, I got a book out um, a few months ago. It's called The Bible, The Quran and the Science. That book is it's so great. Um, it's by an author called Maurice Bukai and then he also goes on to say that the Quran is in modern knowledge it can't be explained um, and therefore it must be the word of God because things that happened hundreds and hundreds of years ago cannot be explained today um, how they knew it sort of thing and it's just a great book you should check it out it's really good. Now, I studied Islam for six months before I converted to Islam and after about a few weeks, a few months of uh, studying, uh, I started to look up into uh, look up the scientific and mathematical miracles of the Quran, and uh, I started thinking to myself, that's how. Uh, if people say that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi would have broke this book, how is it possible that he knew things that we have just discovered ten years ago? So that's when I started thinking that this is mostly God's, God's words. How long have you been a Muslim? Three years. Three years? Yes. Uh, the thing that got me to believe was uh, the scientific miracles of the Quran. Uh, I can't really name that many of them, but so many, yes. yeah, there, are, there are many. However, I discovered the Quran's amazing accuracy on scientific statements in the fields of embryology, geology, astronomy, physics, etc. This led me to logically and rationally conclude that the Quran must be God's word because Muhammad was illiterate. But the Quran is accurate in statements which were only scientifically discovered in modern times. How long have you been a Muslim? Uh, five months. Five months? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was his message. What attracted you to the Muslim faith? Uh, it was the uh, science. Science was uh, what, what made me really revert to Islam. Your brother here, alhamdulillah, he accepts Islam as well. Okay, your brother? Uh, yeah, yeah, alhamdulillah. He's, uh, What's your name? Isa. Let me finish please, then you can argue with me. Yeah? When I read in the Quran about the production of the womb, I could not comprehend it. Do you know why? Because in order for us to know of sperm and to know of the womb and to know of the egg inside the womb and what happens once yeah. they join together, we have to get a microscope or some sort of scanner to have a look, don't we? Yeah. That, the only reason we know today is because we've looked in the microscope, we've looked with the scanners, correct? In the Quran, 1400 years ago, 1000 years before the uh, microscope was invented, it is written in the Quran. And it happened. Scientist Freeman Dyson once wrote, The more I examine the universe and study the details of its architecture, the more evidence I find that the universe, in some sense, must have known we were coming. Indeed, the universe was notified of our coming. 
A multitude of verses in the Quran would attest to that, prepping our planet for the advent of man, the successor of God on earth. One instance in verse 20, chapter 31. Do you not see, O humans, that God has subjugated for you all that is in the heavens and all that is in the earth, and has showered you with his blessings, manifest and hidden? 2031. Yes, Professor Dyson, the universe knew we were coming on a privileged chariot. Or, that is what verse 70, chapter 17 of the Quran tells us. Very truly, we have so honored the children of Adam, for we have carried them through the land and the sea, and we have provided them with all that is wholesome in life, and we have so favored them above most of what we have created with such immense preference. 70, 17. Science writer Bill Bryson sums it all up, confirming man's ultimate privilege in the cosmos. In his trademark style, he addresses us. The only thing special about the atoms that make you is that they make you. That is, of course, the miracle of life. If we, I, you, they, the sun, the earth, and the entire 4% of matter in the observable universe are all created of the same atoms of cosmic dust, we couldn't aspire for a tighter bond. One creation of one creator. It is that organic bond that tells us that we still have yet to learn a great deal about ourselves from our heavenly components. In doing so, while celebrating the merits of life on earth, we should never cease commuting to the heavens, hopefully to reach for more answers and ultimately for the big meaning. That is a quest befitting for man taking us for years and probably centuries to come right through the very thresholds of those heavenly gates, the gates of heaven. the verses concur with, the, the science concurs with the Quran, we need to be able to say, as Muslims, be confident and celebrate that and say, look, our book says this, and you just discovered the same. Thank you.